This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. This episode contains explicit language. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. This is part two of a two-part episode that began last week. So if you have not yet listened to episode 238, you'll want to start there to get the first half of the story. In this series, we're looking at cases where a narcissistic head of a household rules so completely over their family members that they create a cult-like unit. Within this type of dysfunctional home, the head of household rules by fear, abuse, and brainwashing, eroding any freedom or autonomy for their children or partners. In this case, Shelly Notek extended her control not just to her husband and daughters, but also to a young relative and a friend who was invited to live in her home. Both would also suffer torture and abuse at her hands, but her friend Kathy Loreno would become the main target. As we continue the story, Shelley and Dave Notek isolate their family even further from the outside world, and the abuse continues unchecked. No one had any idea what was happening behind the walls of a nondescript farmhouse in Raymond, Washington. When events finally did come to light, it was almost too horrible to be believed. This is part two of The Ties That Bind, the Crimes of Shelley Notek. In 1992, Shelley and Dave Notek purchased a white farmhouse on Monohan Landing Road in Raymond, Washington. Even though it was over 100 years old and needed work, Shelley chose it because it provided privacy from the outside world. When they first moved in, she instructed her daughter Sammy to walk around the property to determine what passersby could see from the road. Privacy is very important to our family, Shelley told her. Shelley had become the all-powerful, cruel queen in her little kingdom, consisting of her subservient husband, Dave Notek, homeless 17-year-old nephew, Shane Watson, and her three daughters, Nikki, age 17, Sammy, 14, and Tori, 5. And of course, Kathy Loreno, her former hairdresser who'd become a friend and was later invited to live with the Noteks. While initially, Kathy thought of Shelley as a good friend, soon after moving into the home, Shelley began abusing Kathy. Living in Shelley's world, Kathy was like the proverbial frog in the boiling pot of water. Shelley raised the heat little by little over the five years Kathy would spend with the Noteks, until almost without realizing it, she was being boiled alive. At the age of 36, Kathy could barely walk or speak from malnourishment, physical abuse, and psychological torture. She was locked in a closet for days and was kept drugged by Shelley with a cocktail of pills the girls later learned included Prozac, the sedative lorazepam, and nitroglycerin pills, amongst other medications. The two oldest children residing in the home, Shane and Nikki, continued to receive regular beatings and harsh abusive punishments. In an invention of her own making Shelley called wallowing, she or Dave would march the kids outside and instruct them to stand in a muddy hole wearing little to no clothes. Then they'd be forced to roll around in the mud while being sprayed with freezing cold water, while Shelley yelled, wallow, at them. But Kathy was still receiving the worst abuse. It had become so frequent and so brutal that Nikki would later describe her as one big bruise. Finally, in July of 1994, Kathy's condition was so bad she couldn't walk, her face drooped on one side, and she could no longer speak intelligibly, but merely moaned or softly babbled in response when spoken to. Dave told Shelley that Kathy looked, quote, real bad, and Shelley, for once, seemed scared. She spoke sweetly to Kathy and told her everything was going to be fine and said she could come inside the house and have a bath. Kathy had been relegated to an unheated pump house outside and only allowed to bathe very rarely. Shelley called Nikki and Sammy to help her drag Kathy to the bathroom. Kathy couldn't even stand at this point on her own. As they tried lifting her into the tub, she slipped and hit the glass shower door, which came out of its track. It crashed to the floor, sending shards of glass falling around Kathy, who had slid onto the floor. She was cut deeply in several places, including her legs and abdomen. Shelley was scared, but knew she couldn't take Kathy to the hospital in her condition, lest she be asked questions. They tried to stop the bleeding with towels, and Shelley applied bandages to Kathy's wounds. She then called Dave to help her move Kathy into an extension off of the laundry room at the back of the house. At least it was inside and heated, which was an improvement from the pump house. 
They moved a mattress onto the floor and laid Kathy on it. Shelley told them that Kathy just needed to rest and she'd be as good as new. The next evening, Dave returned home from work and while passing by the laundry room, heard strange noises coming from inside. Shelley was just leaving the house to pick up her daughter from work when Dave asked her what was wrong with Kathy. Shelley said she was fine, that she was just resting and left. But when Dave entered the laundry room, Kathy was making a gurgling noise. He saw that she had vomited and was choking on it. Screaming for Shane, Dave started attempting to clear the vomit from Kathy's mouth and nose and perform CPR. After several minutes with no response, he realized it was futile. Kathy took one last horrible gasp and stopped breathing. Dave Notek later said he knew he should have called 911, but he didn't want to get Shelly in trouble. Panicked, he called his wife and told her to return immediately. When she got home and was informed Kathy was dead, Shelly seemed genuinely surprised. Still reeling from watching Kathy take her last breaths, Shane told the girls that Kathy was dead. They began sobbing and even Dave cried. But Shelly was all business and pulled Dave aside to speak to him privately. She laid out a plan to cover up Kathy's demise, giving him instructions on what to do. Dave readied the burn pit at the edge of their property, and late that night, after Shelly had taken the kids away to a nearby motel, placed Kathy's body in it and burned it to ash. He took the remains to the beach and scattered them in the ocean. He and Shelly burned what remained of Kathy's possessions the next day. Kathy Loreno died after enduring years of torture, beatings, of being drugged and starved while living with the Notex. While the kids and Dave were walking around shell-shocked, Shelley was all business, already crafting a story to tell Kathy's family or anyone who asked after her. Shelley first warned her family to keep quiet. She convinced them that they would all go to jail if anyone found out what had happened to Kathy. It's interesting to note how Shelley Notek crafted the lies she told people. She laid them out as if they were facts and made others agree that they were true. Shelley said that if anyone asked, they should say that Kathy had gone off with her boyfriend, Rocky, who was a truck driver. She told the kids that it was really important that, quote, you understand and know that Kathy went off with Rocky. You remember my friend Rocky, she added, embellishing the story. Remember how he was so interested in Kathy, wanted to date her? Of course, there was no Rocky. The whole story was something Shelley made up in her warped mind but talked about as if it were true from that moment forward. Dave and the kids knew better than to argue with her and went along with her story. To provide proof, she dug up a blurry photo from somewhere of a woman standing next to a truck. No matter that it didn't resemble Kathy, Shelley probably knew she could convince anyone of anything. Finally, she had Nikki write letters as if they were written by Kathy about her travels with Rocky to Canada, Mexico, and California. She made Nikki practice Kathy's signature and forged them onto the letters. There was only one problem with Shelley's cover-up of Kathy's murder, Shane. Shane kept his mouth shut as instructed, but Shelley must have read something in his demeanor that told her that he might be a threat. If anyone was going to crack and tell someone, it would be Shane. Shane hadn't grown up in the no-tech home and wasn't as fully under Shelley's spell as the rest of the family. Shelley's response to this perceived threat was to threaten Shane, if you tell anyone, she threatened, we'll pin it all on you, Shane. Shane was shocked, but spoke up for himself, saying he didn't do anything and she knew it. She was full of bullshit, he told her. Shelley stood firm. We'll say you killed her. You killed Kathy, she said. Shane backed off, saying he'd never say anything against his family anyway. That's good, Shelley said. But in private, Shelley told Dave that Shane was going to tell. They had to do something to make sure he didn't. Dave Notek was working construction jobs and was sometimes away for days at a time. It was his only reprieve from the roller coaster of living with his wife. The kids, Nikki, Sammy, and Shane, were left to bear the brunt of her abuse. It escalated after Kathy was no longer around to be Shelley's punching bag. Tori was still very young and hadn't yet experienced the same anger and cruelty her siblings had, but later on, she'd be subjected to it as well. No one escaped Shelley Notek's wrath. 
Shane was still tortured by the memory of Kathy's brutal ending. In an unguarded moment in early 1995, he shared a secret with his closest ally, his cousin Nikki. He showed Nikki photos of Kathy taken after a particularly brutal beating. Shane had found the Polaroids in a drawer and hid them by cutting a hole into a stuffed animal and placing them inside. The photos showed Kathy naked, black and blue, and crawling on the floor. Shelley had taken the photos. For what purpose is anyone's guess? To review her handiwork? To ridicule Kathy with them? Shane told Nikki he'd had enough and was going to take the photos to the police and end their nightmare. Nikki said she hated her mother and agreed to go with Shane to the police to turn her mother and Dave in for what they did to Kathy. But Nikki spent a restless night terrified that her mother would get away with everything. Shelly Notek had an uncanny way of talking her way out of anything and convincing people that up was down and black was white. What if the police believed Shelly over Shane? Then what? What did that mean for Nikki? Shane was determined to go to the police with or without his cousin. Even if Shane hadn't told her about the photos, she knew her mother, always paranoid, would believe he had anyway. That meant that Nikki would still reap God knows what kind of punishment or retaliation from her mother. By the next morning, Nikki's stomach was in knots and her nerves were frayed. So with her heart pounding, she approached her mother. Shane has photos of Kathy, she blurted out. Shelley looked at her shocked, then angry. She demanded Nikki tell her everything. Shelley then told her husband what she'd learned. Shane was taken to the pump house by Shelley and Dave. The girls heard their parents yelling threats at Shane and calling him terrible names. They only heard cries and groans in response from their cousin, before he emerged covered in bruises and bleeding. Your parents beat the shit out of me, he told them. Nikki felt terrible guilt and immediately regretted telling on Shane, but something compelled her to do it, she later said. She was just so scared of Shelley. Shane wouldn't admit to having the photos, and Shelley tried to beat their location out of him. She tore up the house looking for them to no avail. Shane was locked up in the pump house and periodically beaten, but the photos were never recovered. Shelley repeatedly insisted to Dave that he needed to get rid of Shane. Dave Notek thought of Shane as a son and couldn't bring himself to do it. But after weeks of Shelley's nagging, threatening, and calling him a worthless piece of shit and worse, in February of 1995, Dave took a 22 caliber rifle into the pump house and shot 19-year-old Shane Watson in the back of the head. When he told Shelley he'd killed Shane, she looked at him wide-eyed. What? Why would you do that, Dave, she asked, washing her hands of any responsibility. The next morning, the girls who'd been given the rare privilege of sleeping over at friends' houses the previous evening were told that Shane had run away. Right away, Nikki and Sammy were suspicious. It was strange that their mother didn't launch an all-out manhunt for him. As a matter of fact, she didn't even seem to look for Shane at all. Always ready with the story, Shelley told the girls that Shane had talked about going to Alaska to work on a fishing boat. Nikki knew this was a lie, but afraid to find out what really happened to her cousin, she convinced herself that maybe Shane had escaped. In any case, the girls didn't ask any more questions. Shane was just gone. How do you take your true crime? Do you like to sit back and sip on a cold drink while someone tells you a story in a soothing voice? There's no better way to explore the dark underbelly of the Deep South. My name is Erica Kelly, and my podcast, Southern Fried True Crime, is like sitting on a front porch, listening to a friend tell you a story, with the slow pull of a slide guitar drawing you in closer. In each episode, I spin a new Southern tale, walking you through the details of the story and giving you a peek inside the community, as well as the crime. Explore historic cases with me, like the saga of Colin and Priscilla Davis in Fort Worth, Texas. It's the perfect example of money and power trumping justice in the South. Or a contemporary, controversial case, like the murder of football legend Steve McNair in Nashville, Tennessee. You can find me on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, iHeart, and many other podcast apps. Just search for Southern Fried True Crime. Until then, y'all take care. Shelley met 54-year-old Ron Woodworth in the late 90s while he was going through a rough patch in his life. 
Ron had moved to South Bend, Washington from Northern California in 1992 with his partner of 17 years, Gary. In 1995, at Ron's urging, his parents also relocated to Washington State. Ron helped care for his father, who was ill at the time. But after his father died a year later, Ron started to change. Always a bit eccentric, he became depressed and angry and lashed out at those around him, especially Gary. By 1997, the relationship had become more than strained and Gary left. Ron responded with anger and never spoke to Gary again. At his job as a licensed caregiver for the elderly, Ron met Shelley Notek, who was hired as a case manager for the Olympic Area Agency on Aging. Her time there was short-lived due to her absenteeism and several write-ups for breaking agency rules and procedures. She and Ron had become fast friends. Ron considered Shelley his best pal, whom he called Shelley Dear. Ron and his mother already had a strained relationship, and as she was wont to do, Shelley worked to create an even bigger wedge between them. Ron was also facing financial troubles, so in 1999, Shelley announced to her family that Ron would be moving in. Her husband was away much of the time now. He and Shelley's marriage had become even rockier after Shane's murder. While Dave still loved Shelley, it was a relief for him to be away from her and the memories of all that had taken place in their home. By the time Ron Woodworth moved into their home, Tori was the only child left in the no-tech house. Nikki had been kicked out and moved in with an aunt before going off to college and renting an apartment of her own. Sammy had also moved out as soon as she was able to do so and was living independently. Tori, 10 years old at the time the man she'd call Uncle Ron moved in, received less physical abuse than her sisters had, although that would change later, but was still subjected to her mother's verbal abuse and emotional manipulation. When Shelley told Dave that she'd offered Ron a place to live, she told him not to worry because Ron was gay. Dave would later say he had kind of wished Shelley had found a new man so he'd be let off the hook. But he loved his daughter Tori and would never leave Shelley if just for that reason alone. And Dave knew if he ever tried to leave his wife, she would have no problem retaliating against him by pinning both Kathy's death and Shane's murder on him. Nope, Dave Notek was stuck with Shelley for good unless she decided differently. At first, just as she'd done with Shane and Kathy, Shelley was very good to Ron. She gave him Sammy's old room, was kind to him, and showered him with small gifts and lots of attention. But in just a couple of weeks' time, she began giving him lists of chores to do. Most of his tasks were outside, yard work and repairs around the property. The lists got longer and longer, and Shelley began berating Ron for work not done to her satisfaction or for working too slowly. She began calling him a piece of shit, worthless, and all her usual insults, but now she also added vile comments about his sexual orientation. Ron had a bit of a belly, and Shelley also began calling him fat and withholding food from him. Of course, she always insisted that everything she did was for his own good. Ron responded each time with, Yes, of course, Shelley, dear. All her abusive patterns began to emerge, taking away Ron's possessions, then his clothes, striking him with objects, moving him out of his room, and relegating him to a mattress on the floor. But Ron was made to spend long days outside doing yard work. He wasn't allowed to enter the house even to use the restroom between 8 a.m. and 7 p.m. Then Shelley would scream at him for, quote, taking a shit in the yard and called him a disgusting animal. Ron did try to leave a few times, but Shelley hunted him down relentlessly until he gave up and returned. He had nowhere to go anyway, having rejected his mother completely with Shelley's prodding. He'd also given up his job burning his bridges with bosses and co-workers due to his increasingly eccentric and angry behavior, which Shelley had also fueled with lies and encouraged. Now that Ron was at her mercy, Shelley increased the abuse. When home, Dave joined in, screaming at Ron and striking him at Shelley's insistence. Ron, like Kathy before him, became a broken person. Also like Kathy, Shelley kept Ron supplied with sedatives, mostly sleeping pills, which he gratefully took each night to escape his miserable existence. By now, Shelley had also taken away most of Ron's clothes, forcing him to work out in the yard in just his underwear. She'd then accuse him of being a sick pervert because he was walking around her house half-nude in front of her young daughter. One day, Shelley told Ron to go up onto the roof of the house to replace some broken shingles. Dave returned home to find Ron lying on the ground bleeding, 
he had slipped and fallen off the roof, injuring himself. Dave yelled at him to get his lazy ass up and yanked him hard. Ron, dazed, tried to stagger into the house, but Shelley screamed at him to get back up on the roof. But the nightmare didn't end there. Once he was on the roof, Shelley told him to jump off of it again. He couldn't believe what she was asking, but she kept screaming at him, threatening him, and making ugly accusations about him until he was sobbing. His spirit completely broken, Ron jumped. This became a favorite punishment of Shelley's, which she employed whenever she felt a need to be entertained. Ron's feet and legs were injured in these falls. His injuries became worse when Shelley took away his shoes and made him work outside barefoot. Like she'd always done, whenever her victims bled or had cuts and scrapes, Shelley and Dave treated them by applying scalding water and bleach to their wounds. Later, Dave Notek would express surprise when investigators told him that using bleach on a person's skin was toxic. Ron's feet became bloody and swollen from being forced to repeatedly jump off the roof. When his feet grew worse and became infected, Shelley made him submerge them in bleach and hot water. Tori would later recall witnessing this act of cruelty, describing it this way in Greg Olson's book, If You Tell. I remember the smell of it like the worst smell ever of my life. It was like the smell of bleach and decomposing flesh, like it was burning his skin off. And it was just terrible. He smelled like he was rotting, literally the smell of dying flesh. He smelled like that for a month, up until the very end. And it was almost the end for Ron Woodworth. His wounds, not able to heal, grew more serious by the day. Shelley gave him more pills, and Tori described seeing Ron walk around like a zombie, glassy-eyed, as if he were no longer present. He was only a shell of a man after two years of Shelley Notek's abuse. The last time Dave saw Ron, his feet were bandaged, he had burns on his head and chest that Shelley said had occurred by accident when he was burning brush, and his finger appeared to be broken. Shelley explained this too, saying that Ron had fallen out of a tree. Shelley called Dave, who was away working on a construction site in the summer of 2003. She said she was worried about Ron. She claimed that Ron was suicidal and asked Dave to come home right away. He had a really bad feeling, but Dave told Shelley there was no way he could leave the job site until that weekend. She never told me he was dead, Ron later said. She didn't have to. I knew it. When Dave got back home to Raymond on July 22, 2003, Shelley reported discovering Ron dead on the back porch. She claimed that he'd succumbed to the heat. Ron liked to lie out there, she said, to cool off his wounds. But a heat wave had gripped the area that week, and he must have just passed in his sleep, Shelley theorized. Dave, of course, wasn't fooled, but said nothing. Shelley explained that she couldn't call an ambulance or take him to see a doctor, because someone might blame her for all Ron's wounds. The wounds Shelley insisted were his own fault, but would look bad for her. She told Dave that she had dragged Ron's body to an outbuilding on the property, dressed him in clean sweatpants, and placed his body into two sleeping bags to cover him up. She then somehow lifted him and placed his body into a big freezer chest. Now she needed Dave to make the body disappear. But unlike his disposal of Kathy and Shane's bodies, Dave didn't have the option of burning Ron's. Pacific County was in the middle of a burn ban due to extremely dry summer weather. So Dave had to dig a pit in the middle of the night in which he placed the body, then covered it over as best he could with dirt and brush. It would have to do temporarily, he thought, until he could find a way to burn the remains at a later date. Dave and Shelley Notek were now responsible for the deaths of three people, Kathy Loreno in 1994, Shane Watson in 1995, and Ron Woodworth in 2003. They made all three victims disappear, and it appeared that they may have gotten away with murder, literally. But unknown to them, their dirty deeds had not gone unreported. A full two years before Ron's death, Shelley's oldest daughter Nikki, now age 26, finally broke her silence. Nikki was now living in Oregon near her grandmother, Laura, and the two had rekindled the strong bond they'd had when Nikki was a newborn. One thing they had bonded over now was their interest in true crime, 
They loved watching true crime shows on television together. Of course, Laura didn't know that the fascination her granddaughter had with the subject was directly tied to real-life criminal activity she had witnessed while living with her mother. One night, as Laura and Nikki finished watching one of these shows, Nikki was triggered to remember what happened to Kathy Loreno. It ate her up inside all over again. The next morning, she approached her grandmother and told her the truth about what had happened to Kathy. Laura was horrified, but not shocked. She believed Nikki immediately, not only because she had never known Nikki to be a liar, but also because she knew Shelly so well and that it was something that she was capable of. Laura told Nikki they needed to report it to the authorities immediately. Nikki was scared, but with her grandmother at her side, she agreed. So in July of 2001, they drove to the sheriff's office to report a crime that had occurred in 1994 in Pacific County, Washington. They were connected to the Pacific County Sheriff Jim Bergstrom and gave him all the details. He said he'd investigate and get back to them, but days passed and Nikki heard nothing from him. Later, when she spoke with him again, he told her that the matter had already been investigated after Kathy's family filed a report. They also had had their suspicions that something had happened to Kathy while she was living with the Notex. The sheriff had not turned up any evidence of a crime. Then the matter was dropped. Shelley had been very careful to isolate her victims from anyone who cared for them. In this way, she was able to keep complete control over them without interference from the outside world. As a result, they had nowhere to turn for help or support when things got really bad. Her two oldest girls had left home as soon as they could. Shelley kept her youngest child, Tori, isolated from her sisters. While she didn't allow a lot of communication between Tori, Nikki, and Sammy, Sammy still managed to keep in touch with her little sister. In August 2003, Sammy called Tori, and during the course of the conversation, she asked, How's Ron? Tori answered, I think he's dead. I think Mom did something to him, too. She broke down in sobs and shared the details of Ron's abuse, his decline, and finally his disappearance. She told her sister that her mother said Ron had left to take a job in another town up north, but there was no way Ron could work, Tori said. He could barely walk the last time she'd seen him. Sammy told Tori they needed to talk to Nikki so Tori could fill them both in on everything she knew. When the three sisters spoke that night, Tori, now 14, shared that she was receiving some of the same types of abuse they had when they were her age. She'd been locked in a dog kennel and sprayed with cold water from a hose. Their mother subjected her to nude inspections to humiliate her and make her feel ashamed. Shelley had also started withholding food and locking Tori out of the house leaving her in the heat or freezing temperatures for hours. Then, just recently, she told them, Shelley had forced her to swallow pills that she believed were some kind of sedative. Tori, while afraid of her mother, was also angry. She needs to be stopped, she told her sisters. She's evil. So on August 6, 2003, Nikki and Sammy drove to Pacific County together to speak to the sheriff once more. This time, they were taken seriously partially because the sheriff had recently received a missing persons report about Ron Woodworth. A friend of Ron's had been searching for him and had gotten the runaround from the Notex. Then Nikki shared with him what Tori had said about being drugged by their mother. He called in Child Protective Services, and the next morning, Sheriff Bergstrom, along with a deputy and a CPS caseworker, knocked on the door of the Notex home in Raymond, Washington. When Shelley opened it, Bergstrom told her they'd received a report of suspected child abuse and were removing Tori from her home until an investigation was concluded. Shelley, surprised, stayed silent. Tori was taken to her room by the deputy to gather some of her personal belongings. While she walked upstairs with him, she whispered in his ear, You need to get a search warrant and come back. In the pole building, there's a bunch of Ron's stuff. She told him that if they didn't search soon, she was sure her mom and dad were going to burn any evidence that was left. Tori said she'd found a few other things of Ron's and hid them in the chicken coop. She was taken to a temporary placement with a foster family as the sheriff continued the investigation. Shelley Notek was freaking out now that she was finally facing suspicion after years of controlling, abusing, torturing, and murdering her boarders. She called her husband to come home immediately after Tori was taken from their home by the sheriff and CPS. She ordered him to find out where Tori had been taken. Dave, worried, exhausted, and anxious about what the investigation might uncover, 
went directly to the sheriff's department to get information about his daughter. Investigators asked if he agreed to be interviewed, and believing that they were only inquiring about suspected child abuse, something he denied, he agreed to speak with them. But as soon as they got him into an interrogation room, Dave Notek was hit with a barrage of questions regarding Ron Woodworth and Kathy Loreno. Caught off guard, he tried to come up with the story on the spot, but kept contradicting himself. Finally, he broke down, began crying, and told them where Ron had been buried and where Kathy's ashes had been scattered. He admitted he'd burned her body in a fire pit. Then he dropped a bombshell that officers didn't see coming. There was a third victim, Shelley's nephew Shane. He confessed to having killed Shane and disposing of his body in the same manner as Kathy's. Dave Notek was placed under arrest. Shelley was also arrested and charged with two counts of second-degree murder for the deaths of Kathy Loreno and Ron Woodworth. She pled not guilty. Dave Notek took a plea deal on three counts, second-degree murder for Shane Watson, unlawful disposal of human remains, and rendering criminal assistance in the first degree. Dave was sentenced to 15 years at the Monroe Correctional Facility. Shelley Notek would take an Alford plea, which meant the state had enough evidence to convict her, but that she was not claiming guilt. The court found her guilty of second-degree murder and first-degree manslaughter. Based on the nature of her crimes, the prosecution asked for a sentence above the standard, but a week later before her sentencing, a landmark Supreme Court ruling, Blakely v. Washington, tied the court's hands with the standard range of sentencing. She was sentenced to 266 months for both charges, or 22 years. Eight months after receiving her sentence, Shelley Notek tried to withdraw her Alford plea, claiming she didn't understand what she was agreeing to but the court upheld it and her appeal was denied. She remains incarcerated at the Washington Corrections Center for Women in Gig Harbor as of this writing. She will be eligible for parole this year, 2022. She will be 68 years old. Shelley Notek still claims innocence of her crimes. Dave Notek was released from prison in 2016 and works in a seafood processing plant on the Washington coast. He is still in contact with his daughters, Sammy and Tori. Nikki has not forgiven him and refuses to speak to him. Nikki is married and the mother of three children. She and her husband own and operate a landscaping business. Sammy is also married and also has three children. She still lives in Raymond and is a teacher. Tori works for a social media firm in Colorado. That will do it for this special two-part episode of Once Upon a Crime. Quite a story, right? There's a lot more to it than I could cover, even in two parts. So if you want to hear more about this fascinating case, including information about a possible fourth victim of Shelley Notek, additional details regarding other bizarre forms of abuse she subjected her victims to, and more theories about this case, you can hear all of that in a bonus discussion episode on Patreon. To become a Patreon member, to receive bonus episodes like this, as well as early release ad-free episodes and cool OUAC swag in the mail, Go to patreon.com slash once upon a crime to get all the details and join. If you love true crime books, pick up the book about this case titled If You Tell by Greg Olson. I've included a link to it in the show notes. It's a fascinating read and one of my most favorite true crime books. Once Upon a Crime is written and produced by me, Esther Ludlow. My administrative and production assistant is Lorena Garcia, and additional research for this episode was provided by Susie St. John. I'll be off next week to head to CrimeCon, but I've got a whole new series beginning on Monday, May 2nd. If you're going to CrimeCon in Las Vegas on April 29th, make sure to come and see me on Podcast Row and say hi. I can't wait to meet you. You can still get tickets at CrimeCon.com and still take advantage of my discount code, onceupon22, for 10% off. Those of you in the UK have two great events to look forward to, and I'll be featured at both. CrimeCon UK in London will take place on June 10th and 11th, and CrimeCon UK Glasgow will be held for its inaugural year on Saturday, September 10th. I can't wait for both of these epic events. Will I see you there? Go to crimecon.co.uk to find out more and grab my discount code link in the show notes. And until next time, be good to one another.